we have Mr. Hughes with us and anyone else in the room who might wish to talk with us about um, S-281 this morning. Um, so, Mark, if you would like to join us, I would. we're glad to hear. Good morning. Good morning. And as a committee, we'll be talking about this bill um, exactly the committee discussion without take, you know, without uh, witnesses giving testimonies per se, but if there are witnesses watching and you know, obviously always <coughs> welcome to this. But uh one as well as the bill that we'll be taking testimony on starting at ten thirty with the committee. We've got time for ourselves to try and sort through things exactly. And for the record for the record, I'm Mark Hughes, uh, executive director of Justice for All. <clears throat> Welcome. Again. Good to see you again. Madam Chair, thank you uh, so much for uh, for having me back. Uh, committee, I thank uh, thank you all for <coughs> not just entertaining me uh, last time and not going to sleep, but um <laughs> but having me back this time as well. I brought you a gift, and I was going to bring you one scoop from Jerry's yesterday, but it all melted. Mm -hmm. So I, I have some, some other things for you, so if you could just pass these around. These are um, just a um, little bit of research in, uh, in form of education uh, on systemic racism that we put together, some of our research folks put together for you. I meant to bring that last time. Um, <clears throat> and you don't get to read it while I'm talking. No, I'm just kidding. So, so I wanted to come back and just um, offer up just a, a, a couple of final thoughts because uh, there's a few things that I think that I, I left out. And also, I, I believe that I um, pretty much um, loaded you down with a lot of information with at least one email that I sent, I think, uh, included in that email. There was a, right, some attachments. I, I believe one of those attachments um, was the... Um, that will go black if I don't touch it once in a while. Oh, I, th I thought you were, I thought you were trying to key me in on something. No, no. <laughs> I would have appreciated it. So one of those attachments was was the um, was actually um, the um, the original or the amended version that the coalition put forward of S two eighty one. I think uh, within that, and you'd have to help me out here, but I think also within there, I think there was some. Um, in the body of the message, there was some some language surrounding some some challenges that we were having with S two eight S eight sixty eight as it was released from uh, legislative council. Why, why don't you just talk us through everything because our sure. brains get mushy mm -hmm. with regard to mm -hmm. all the different bills. Absolutely, around. absolutely. That was, so and that would be the most frankly the most respectful approach. To the information you want to make sure is mm -hmm. clear to us. Sure, absolutely. So how, how about if what I do is, is uh, I will start with, um, with, that, with that email, uh, with the content of that email, and I, I'll just be uh, crystal clear on what that looked like. And folks, it's on our web page. Under which date, Denise, do you recall? Um, yes, it it's under today's. I moved oh, it over. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Yeah. Did you go out? Yeah, 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 no, I uh, refreshed it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So you did? Our, our, yeah. our okay. devices have been sitting for, for a few minutes. They go to sleep. <clears throat> so what, I, what I'll do is, is I just want to start with the content of that email. And um, I asked you when I was here last time if you would please consider uh, looking at 868, which is still there, and the in comparison in terms of the content uh, that was uh, that was in the um, what you received with 281, because we um, uh, noticed some problems, or some issues there. So let's let's just talk about uh, 828 just for a couple of minutes because what I what I don't want to create is confusion by you going back to 828 uh, and looking at it and thinking that uh, what was produced from Legislative Council, although it's leaps and bounds ahead of what S-281 was when it first came out of Ledge Council, and, and, it's, and it almost contains everything uh, that we were looking for with the exception of the expansion of the Human Rights Council, uh, Human Rights Commission. 
Um, there are about eight, eight things that I want to bring to your attention uh, that um, that were that we had some challenges with in 1868. Okay. So hold that thought. Sure. Jim has a question. Just a that. quick question. Yes, sir. Um, S-281, mm -hmm. as it was introduced, mm -hmm. was it a companion bill to H-868? Like, was it just the same, basically same version initially? Mm -hmm. That's, that is how it was intended to be okay. introduced, but it was not because... So there it, were two different versions? They were two, there were okay. two separate versions because what we introduced with 868, because the deadlines in Ledge Console are a little bit you know, uh, beyond that the in the Senate, yeah, okay. we were able to get more of the language in the, the bill that, that we wanted. And plus, in the House, you guys being a, a one heck of a lot smarter than the Senate, then, you know, we, I just had to throw that out there. I usually show up with some, you know, I got to somehow or another figure out how to get at it. So, um, so here's, here's what we're looking at in those eight points are, um, number one, the, the Equity Commission should serve as an independent agency, not under the HRC. So you will see in H-68 that it was actually, uh, came out of Ledge Council under the HRC. We never intended that to be the case. Uh, and I think um, we had a brief discussion on that last, last time I was here. Um, the second point was is Title IX, uh, 4552. Um, what we were looking to introduce was a request for a separation of roles for litigators and, uh, and uh, investigators in the HRC. Um, so we, we'll, we can come back to that if necessary. Uh, and also the third point was is in Title IX. Oh, hang on. If we could ask, if it's okay with you, if sure. we have questions as you go point by point, sure. it might be most efficient if we ask our questions point by point. Noted, and I, and I appreciate the um, that that being pointed so, out because I have a tendency of taking off sometimes. So thank you for reeling me well, back. We want to make sure we keep off of you. Sure, okay. and I also want to make sure that this is productive as well. So is, are, are we okay so, so far? Hang on. So so committee. Any questions for Mark with regard to point number one regarding the Equity Commission uh, and its being independent? Yes. Okay, Jim. so on, on point number one, the Senate version, is it not funded? It is. It's okay. funded. So you're just saying keep it, that portion of the Senate bill, <clears throat> and it is independent, right? It is. Okay. I just so I want to make sure this isn't asking for something that's not in the Senate sure. bill, and one doesn't appear to be. Sure. Okay. And, and just for clarity, the the only thing I'm walking through with you right now is is, is 868 as it stands alone. Okay. Okay. I mean, not even considering 281. Just in the event that you should go and take a look at it, these are just a few things that I'd like you to keep in mind. Okay. If you choose to compare. The, uh, the version of the Senate version of the bill 281 uh, to it just to, to be able to you know if if possible or necessary get some language from it that might be useful does that answer your question mm -hmm. and then I've got a question with regard to point one also sure uh, equity commission I had in my notes from your, uh, your that day, the first day we took time of testimony mm -hmm. um, that Wednesday morning last week. Wednesday morning last week. I can't remember that long. It, it was. Um, I had a notation mm -hmm. that everyone uh, was in agreement that the word civil rights should be taken out of the title of the chief officer and of the panel. And um, almost anything would do other than those words. But it was recommended that somehow mitigation and racism, either both terms or at least one or the other, be included in the titles of the, the officer and the, the uh, panel. So here I'm looking at Equity Commission. Mm. That's this. It's you, labeled from January 15th. Okay, so, but you're not s suggesting that Equity Commission is, is, a prop, is a good alternative name. It just happens to be. It, it could be. It could be. As we, when we put this forward, um, we ran into a, a few. Um, questions about the, the terminology commission and what does commission mean constitutionally? Mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 is, what is the governor's authority with, uh, with commissions? And it, should this be a commission? Uh, and, and because there are many commissions. So um, I think 
that we kind of just step back from and let um, you know let that kind of flesh itself out in terms of what the uh, what your um, what the Senate Gov Ops uh, came up with. And again, as I read last week, um, uh, Senator White was uh, fully expecting this this body to to change the, the name. And Rob has. Well, I'm, I'm a, well, it's sort of one and two. I'm a little confused here. On, on one, you're, you're asking that the commission be an independent agency, but then you go on to question two, and you're saying that there needs to be a separation role of the litigators and investigators in the Human Rights mm -hmm. Commission. That's a good question. So, so let's just let, let me just uh, make it very clear that the it was always from day one the intent of this legislation to adjust, to address systemic racism as well as uh, explicit uh, racism. So um, the, the main portion of this bill deals with that body that or the panel that, that would appoint an officer and that would have the responsibilities for systemic, systemic racism. There's a, couple, there's a few other things that we try, we're trying to get done or we're hoping to get done in this bill and, and they are communicated pretty clearly in H868. Uh, number one is, is to address racial profiling and, and with traffic stops and so forth. Uh, which clearly has nothing to do with systemic racism. Uh, the, uh, the second one has to do with uh, introducing a, um, a, um, a more um, concise and, uh, and unified approach to use of force, or should we say appropriate use of force, across all 79 agencies to include data collection, policy, and training. And then the third one was the expansion of the HRC. Okay, so what you've touched upon is, is the third point, and that is, uh, as we went in and took a look at what the HRC looks like, the first thing we determined was is that, and I think everyone around the table probably already knows this, is, is that they're underfunded. That they just, and, they don't, and they're understaffed. And we wanted to bring that out as a, as a very important point, uh, because, uh, you know, as we work through this and address the systemic racism, the same thing we found out with law enforcement is, is number one, there's a crossover and there's a place in time where um, you, know, you stop looking at systemic racism and you start looking at explicit bias, you know, as the proliferation of, of um, and the rollback, of, I should say, of, of civil liberties at the national level have, have occurred and we've thought it to be uh, important for us to be looking at that even more closely at this state. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> I guess mm -hmm. I'll wait and reword okay. for later. Thank you. So, so I have a follow-up mm -hmm. to your question. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't ask it right now. I'm going to anyway. Uh, so this point number two, a a am I inferring correctly or incorrectly that this is a suggestion that you're advocating regardless of whether or not the, the panel, uh, you know, the mitigation panel, for whatever <clears throat> whatever we end up calling it, um, whether or not it's housed with HRC, that you're suggesting yes. that this yes. uh, clarification you made <clears throat> HRC separate from whether separate from <clears throat> the question as to where the panels housed. Yes. Correct. So, so no, no matter where the panel's housed, and for those in the room who, who, who can't see this, this is what it's saying: is, is this a sep there should be a separation of roles within the Human Rights Commission, where the investigators and the litigators are not the same people. That was the answer I was looking for. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Thanks, man. <laughs> You're welcome. So, no matter where the panel is housed. This is a proposal in regard to how HRC is set up. Right, and, I, and to, in my personal opinion, I believe the reason why it doesn't exist today, I mean, you'd have to add, you'd have to call Karen uh, Richards to, for for a professional opinion, but I think the reason why it doesn't exist today is is because there's there's a shortage of staffing. But they don't have the people to do it. Thank you, uh, Karen. Do you, would you want to, I see an invitation as as the as the attorney. Would you want to comment on this? point right now or um, I can if it would okay, be helpful. Sure. Okay, Karen Richards, uh, Executive Director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. There is actually presently and currently a separation in those two roles within the Human Rights Commission. So mm -hmm. um, the investigators do not litigate. They're attorneys, but they do not do the litigation. The litigation is my responsibility. So 
um, what happens is if there's a finding of reasonable grounds and a decision that we should go to court, then it is me that litigates it. Um, I think where Mr. Hughes may be confused is we had some earlier conversations about the fact that um, given my the the breadth and depth of my responsibilities, which I've explained to all of you previously, that it is very difficult in this position to do litigation at the same time that you're over here and you're doing all the other responsibilities of the job. So having a separate litigator position would be ideal, um, but it's not because there's not a separation between those two roles presently. Thanks for that. Got it. Yes? Thank you. Okay. Does that help? I think so. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. The, the third point is, is uh, uh, Title 94554, um, one of the things that we were looking at in, with that particular title and those conversations that, again, we've had with Karen on this, and maybe we didn't get this one quite so wrong, is that the, um, in our, in reviewing this, there's, there's a, a clause there that says that there's efforts efforts to resolve the matter by formal means prior to determination of whether there's reasonable grounds to believe that unlawful discrimination has occurred. And uh, as a, an adv advocate in, in working in the community, I'm pretty um, familiar with a lot of folks who finally find some relief. If they can't get it through legal aid, uh, they can't get it through pro bono, they don't have money, the, um, the, the folks over at the ACLU are not going to take the case up. Uh, they spend for a while and it's, it's hugely traumatic to, to have to be deprived of one's civil liberties, not knowing where you're going to live, where you're going to work. And finally making it to the HRC and then, um, although I know procedurally this typically doesn't happen at the HRC, but statutorily it seems to be mandated that these things, uh, that these cases could simply be, um, um, they could be just um, moved off to the side before a determination has been made. Uh, typically, I would think that it would be at the discretion of the, um, of the, of the litigant, the, the one who's uh, bringing the charges up. And, and I believe that the, the current um, uh, staff over there pretty much uh, does that, but, it, but the, the, the statute says but if, you know, if we were to go by the letter of law, say for example, we got another executive director, um, the statute says that this is what needs to happen. I think that language is is, is inappropriate. What needs to happen, mm -hmm. according to existing statute, mm -hmm. is that there should be efforts to resolve the matter informally. Correct. What's <clears throat> that's what the current statute says there should be. An there should be efforts made to, to resolve it formally before such time as reasonable grounds has e have even been determined. That's the ch challenge that we're having with that. So you want to strike that language? I do. And okay. it should not be, okay, go on. Um, well. I guess I'm a little confused here. So, so you're looking to address this issue formally before reasonable grounds are found? No, uh, we're, we're looking to have reasonable grounds, have a determination made uh, prior to such time as, a, uh, as it can be um, um, resolved. Uh, well, put it, I, I think I misstated that. We're looking to not have statutorily mandated a resolution before a formal determination. You say it one more time, I'm sorry. We're looking to not have statutorily mandated a, a, a resolution before formal determinations. Not statutorily. I think it should be an option, but you, you shouldn't statutorily say, you know, you must resolve this before such time as it's determined. I guess I'm confused in the sequence of events here. I mean, how how do you resolve something if you don't know that there's even an issue? That's my point exactly. And, and your solution would be what, Mark? <clears throat> what, this, what this statute says is, is that you would resolve something before you even know it's an issue. That's what the statute says. You asked a very good question. How can you resolve something if you don't even know that there's an issue? So if you read that language once again, that language says that you, <clears throat> that you must resolve something before you know that there's an issue. That's why we want this language stricken. 
I withdraw my question. Other committee member questions on that? Uh, if I could, Karen, uh, from the perspective of the Human Rights Commission, is there any common comment you would want to make with regard to point number three? Sure. <laughs> Again, Karen Richards, executive you, director. You never know what's going to be thrown in your direction That's as right. you walk in here. <laughs> That's all right. That's why I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, what the statute says is that attempts should be made to, uh, to reach an informal resolution prior to making a determination. Um, that language is base what it basically um, empowers us to do is work on conciliation as we're continuing to investigate. So that's the process, and that has always been the process at the Human Rights Commission from I'm the fourth executive director, that's always the way it works. So that's our understanding of the statute, which is basically that somebody files a complaint, um, you start gathering facts about both sides, and then you start um, asking the parties, is there some way you want to resolve this matter prior to us completing an, a full investigation and writing a report? Um, so there's no way we would, we either resolve it or we write a report, um, and then we try to resolve it again, but we would never um, resolve it and then write a report. That makes no sense. Um, so the, that's not an um, accurate interpretation. So, uh, Jessica. so you're supportive of striking the language? No, I'm not. not. Um, <laughs> and partly because our HUD contract requires us to begin trying to conciliate matters from the time that we that they're filed, and it put it could potentially put our HUD funding in jeopardy if that language were stricken from our statute. Um, it's very important that we have that tool, and it's in part to protect parties, because a lot of times um, the parties may have more immediate needs um, for resolving the matter than they have time to wait for us to complete a full investigation of the matter. Um, and other times it may be that the complainant filing the complaint is has a weaker case than they may have thought once the evidence starts coming out, and they may be better off with a resolution than a no reasonable grounds finding, at which point they have nothing. And so that's how we use conciliation is to assist people in reaching um, a conclusion that is in their best interest, mm -hmm. and, and we, we don't resolve things that the complainant resolves it. The mm -hmm. complainant and respondent agree to a settlement. The Human Rights Commission just helps to facilitate that. Which is the way our whole city, you hope that the whole system works. It makes sense. It's how we run our households. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> when you can. Who wants to get a little run first? Cindy? Yeah. Who did you say? HUD? HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. They, they provide about um, a quarter of our funding. Um, then they pay us to investigate the housing cases. So. Um, and they require that our um, state language in our statute be substantially equivalent to what is um, provided under federal law. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why we have that that's limitation. Law. Right. So if, if we were to change our statute in that way, it would affect potentially <coughs> their designation of us as a substantially equivalent agency, which would mean that they could pull their funding, which is in the 80 $85,000 range and, and is a chunk of my budget. So uh, that would mean laying off an investigator, basically. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> you went on, Karen, and answered a question that was in my head with regard to so how much money we talk about. <coughs> okay. Uh, do we have the information we need on point three? Okay. I would just conclude on, on point three is, is uh, this discussion, this difference in opinion that Karen and I share, is this is not a new development. We've had this conversation before. <laughs> and uh, um, and the, the, the legis again, the statute is quoted here. Um, and it, what it says is efforts to resolve the matter by formal means prior to determination of whether there is a reasonable ground to believe that unlawful discrimination has occurred. That is what the statute says which means um, by law, 
that is what the, the HRC is required to do, which means the litigant, the person who's filing the complaint, does not, by law, have a right to be involved in that decision because the law says that it must be done, okay? And those are, who are in my category, my protected category, have little patience or time to say that the justification for this law is because the HRC needs an additional $85,000, $85, okay? Because once again, it sounds like the federal government is buying out our civil liberties very much like they're buying it out on the police side when it comes to sanctuary cities and the $500,000 that our state police held out for, okay? So this happens quite frequently and it's the foundation of much of the systemic racism that I came here to talk to you about. So that's my conclusion We've got point your three. Respective okay. points of view. We're, we're, we're gathering the information. Mm -hmm. So, so the point four, um, section uh, four three B, uh, should state uh, each government agency and education organization. The the original uh, language of this bill when it was put forward was um, always intended to include education. Okay, that's in eight sixty eight. And in point five, in 868, you, um, oh, again, no, hang on I'm sorry. Committee, any questions with regard to John? Well, for? What do you mean by education organization? Education agencies that is, exist within the state government. So it would be colleges and the agencies themselves. Uh, the agency now they would be, of education? Yeah. And the state colleges? Right. Okay. Thank you. Other state questions? colleges, not UVM? Or any of the private? It's, it's, I, what we, we, have, we went round and round about this, and the only thing we could come up with is, is that we could not affect change in institutions that were not state agent, that were not under the state agency. So, so no. not including UVM. Here. UVM is not a state school. Understood, yes. not yep. technically, okay. but are receiving state money, however paltry uh, in the amount. So there might be a way to get at that. So it's cool. Yeah. It's part of the state system. Okay. So if UVM will be included. <clears throat> so we can clarify that. I'm seeing s scowls. Any, anyway, <laughs> easily enough checked. Yeah. I had thought of it in terms of the state because of the state money, the instrumentality of the state concept and all of that. But moving on, we'll figure this out. Okay. Number five. And um, point five uh, is an additional, uh, Ms. Lee Richards is going to think we're picking on her for after a while here. Uh, an, an additional litigator and an outreach coordinator should be added to the HRC. And, and I think, again, I, I think the deduction of this, this whole two, two additional headcount at the HRC had a, had a couple factors, few factors. Number one, this is what we've already discussed because it, it, what you've noticed is, is once we got to the end of that conversation, we were at a conclusion that if we were gonna do something another way, that we would need additional resources to do it, okay? So this is the presumption that we would be doing things another way in the HRC, that there would be less time devoted in, say for example, um, training uh, directed at implicit bias, and maybe that training at the HRC, um, that training uh, component, that lift, would be a part of this new role that we're creating, their responsibilities. So that might free some of their time up. But even if that doesn't happen, if, um, you know, if, if we're talking about um, trying to, you know, fill in a litigator and, and, and bring in an outreach coordinator, it still comes back to money. And, and we've spent about as much money as most of you make in about three or four months on this issue in, the, in its history. Well, um, Mark, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of recommendations here for staffing, mm -hmm. but I have yet to hear anybody totally qualify what the issue is that we're trying to get at, mm -hmm. as far as just how pervasive is it throughout government, and mm -hmm. I'd like to know how big the problem is before I, I talk about staffing up mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. Well. There's two answers to that. I think um, number one is is that um, you know if you take a look at the explicit part of the conversation, which is this whole HRC business where we were talking about staffing, you know I'd have to 
I'd have to defer uh, to Karen Richards. A lot of that stuff is in executive st session, and there, there will be stuff, there will be investigations, there will be stuff that's been uh, settled, if you will, uh, prior to the time it was determined. Uh, there will, there's, and we're not just talking about systemic racism. There are all protected categories under the HRC. There's a pretty good caseload, and I think from what we see on the outside, um, yeah, I think they stay pretty busy at the HRC, okay? Um, as it pertains to systemic racism, that's what I came qualified to talk to you about. And what we know uh, is, is, is that there's only one place where we can measure it, and that's part of the, the issue that we're trying to resolve. Um, the only place we can measure it, as I stated in my last testimony, is, is in the criminal justice system, specifically with law enforcement, because we've been collecting data for the last 10 years, okay? And part, the creation of this, this function and this role is explicitly for the purpose of beginning the process of, cre of collecting data across the remainder of the criminal justice system, as well as housing, education, access to health services, and employment, and economic development. So 10 years ago, sir, they were saying the same thing about law enforcement that you just said. But because we started collecting data, we've determined that there is an issue. And if we believe systemic racism exists one place, then does it exist every place? And if it does, how do we measure it? And that's what we're here to talk about. But it seems like based on testimony we heard the other day, mm -hmm. that people are pointing to law enforcement and others as an example of how it has really, I think the term was used that the glass is three quarters full. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if, if, if we're continually making steady progress, mm -hmm. um, why is that a bad thing? Well, for the record, I never said it was a bad thing. Um, yeah, just, just, just to say, just to make sure that we're on the right track here, what I said was is it, it was the only measurable function within the government, okay? Um, and because we're able to measure it, I guess you could extrapolate yourself that it's a bad thing because we've discovered, you know, not very pleasant information about the numbers that came out of it. But the only reason we were able to do that is because we collected the information. And that's why law enforcement stands as a shining example for this, this methodology that we're rolling out because they have proven that we can measure it. And as Deming said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Jess, are we at some measure last, the last time we spoke on Wednesday? I thought I heard, too, that we um, are hearing data from the HR of our state employees that we do have um, a higher than, um, for people of color, there is a higher turnover rate um, mm -hmm. in our ranks. So that would be another area where we've begun, to, maybe we've only just begun, I don't know how long we've been collecting that data, but. Um, that's, a, that's, that's also, I've, I've heard the same thing, and I've heard also things in, um, in housing from the uh, legal aid report on 2015 of some of the challenges there and some of the benchmarks that could be measured on a regular basis. But you've hit upon something. And what you've hit upon is is uh, part of the key is because as this person or these, this panel, as, they roll, as we roll this out, the expectation is, is that those key data points, uh, that they would be nailed down, that we would make a final determination on exactly what those data points were and then begin the process to consistently collect that data on a regular basis and to be able to aggregate that data and to correlate that data and make it just as meaningful as the data that we get from law enforcement. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, so Mark, one of the things that's been con confusing in the testimony that we've heard mm -hmm. is, is whether the data does not exist or whether it's just not centralized. <laughs> and, and I mean, um, I've heard that there needs to be better centralization and transparency of the data, and, but I've heard a lot of testimony that the data exists. And, and so, I mean, do you disagree with that statement that the data exists? Which data? Well, we have never heard in specific terms what the data is. Mm -hmm. um, the only real specifics we've ever had is the, the data on traffic stops. Mm -hmm. um, but we have heard general testimony that the data exists, it's just maybe difficult to find. 
So you're talking about other data besides traffic stuff? Yes, because I mean the bills do speak to centralization of data, and so right. that would make me assume that there is data. Right. And there was reference in the earlier testimony with regard to the, the Act 50. Four. Mm -hmm. Right, report. report. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, I think the, the, the answer to the question is, is yes, the data exists. I think the logically, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously, you know, I can't give you, you know, speak to you empirically, but uh, logically, every single function in this government is supported. Um, just full disclosure, uh, my background, computer system security. Um, so when we start talking about business impact analysis uh, in, in terms of looking at a business and looking at business processes, looking at systems and networks that support those business processes, those databases and so forth, uh, looking for critical uh, points of failure within those, uh, those, those data chains, I am a, an expert in that area. Okay, so when you, when you look at data processes uh, in terms of uh, are the are the business processes really associated with any business function across the entire organization? What you will find is, is first of all, what they do. The question is, is what information do they need in order to get done what they do? And the other question is, is what applications, what systems, what net networks, and what databases uh, traversing and, and, and occupying is that data? And, and almost every function that occurs across this uh, this government, at some point or another, there is a data entry function that occurs. Okay, so yes, um, I can, you know, I can assure you that there are data, and and it, and, and they are there. Um, the question is, is what data? Is the first question that I ask you because, you know, when we went to law enforcement, we didn't say bring us the data. Of what we said in Act 134, 2012, we said bring us this data. Will you stop? Do you stop someone? Do you search them? Do you, you know, did you find anything? Did you arrest them? Did you cite them? We gave specific details. We missed use of force, but we gave them specific details on exactly what data they were to be collecting, and they've been collecting exactly that data for the last 10 years, uh, maybe five or six um, um, legislatively mandated. And as a result, we've been able to gather that information. So the question is, in <coughs> housing, for example, or in education. What data? What are those critical decisions that have high impact that could potentially in adversely impact people that clearly are informed by discretion, uh, by by um, uh, by bias? By so there's high levels of discretion. You know, what are two or three of those um, decision points, if you will, or more, that we can? identify and mandate, if necessary, that that data be collected, and then we'll start talking about the aggregation of that data and the correlation of that data across that particular system. But it gets bigger than that, because the big data is, is how do we aggregate and correlate all systems? And I think that's part of the function of this role. And the whole, the depot data question, that mm -hmm. gets to point six and seven. Sure. Mm -hmm. So six is general observation. Um, <coughs> Just going over the the, uh, the legislation itself, uh, again, uh, 868, it just occurred to us that we never really defined at what point agencies were going to begin to collect that data. Uh -huh. Those data? So I, I guess um, it seems like we got a little bit of cart before the horse here. Um, mm -hmm. You're talking about collecting data, but sometimes I don't know that we're even, are we asking the right questions to collect the data from? Because you and I, if, if we're working on an issue together, but we're not really talking about mm -hmm. that issue, you may have questions that I never even think of. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the data that's out there, there doesn't seem to be a general consensus on what even the questions are, does there? <clears throat> I'm going to have to ask you to restate your question because I, I really don't understand where you're, where you're going. Well, when, when, when you're, you're referring to that mm -hmm. there's data out there, mm -hmm. but my sense of things is, is that there's no general consensus as to what's the questions that we should be asking uniformly to get that data from. Say, for instance, okay, we're talking about people of color and the turnover in, in state government, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you could just say, okay, 
you take that one given number, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe it's not the work environment that's causing the turnover. Mm -hmm. It's something more personal. Mm -hmm. Where in, in the private sector, we have what's called an exit interview, where you go through and you spend some time with the employee. I'm familiar with the private sector. <laughs> Pardon me? I said I'm familiar with the private sector. Okay. So, you know, you're, you're trying to drill down a little bit to find out where you have mm -hmm. that turnover, because as an right. employer, I get a lot of money right. invested in you, and I want to know why you're going. Right. So I, I think I do understand your question. And, and again, I, I think stated the, your question, stated the car before the horse, is, is uh, I don't know, your, your question is almost characterized as such, because um, you can't really do an analysis on the data until you get the data. So you know, the state police weren't able to, to uh, contextualize or to quantify or qualify or challenge uh, anything until they begin to collect the data. So now they're at a point uh, to where there's a pushing and pulling with Stephanie Seguino, and they're saying, well, you know, maybe it was dark. Well, you know, um, the, you know actually, um, there's a lot of folks coming across the border. You know, so there's a, there's a lot of context that has to go into um, you know, analyzing the data after the data are collected. But first, you've got to get the data. So maybe your question is, how do you decide which data? And if, if that's the question, then again, I think, once again, that's totally the cart before the horse. Because what needs to happen is, is we need to task you know, some type of uh, organization or consulting agency or depend upon this particular function to go in and conduct some type of consultative approach to be able to do a business impact analysis to make a determination as to what types of decisions that are being made that are highly impactful before you determine which data collect to collect. And hopefully it would be that data that represents those high impact decisions that are typically highly discretionary. Thank you. If I could make it perhaps connected to a good other um, With regard to point seven, is an example of what you're talking about, Mark, in, in point seven, speaking specifically about law enforcement, race traffic data collection is supposed to start up, a, up again. It's not required. <clears throat> to start up again until June 30 of 2019. Is that meaning that it's not, it's not required to be collected now and the intent, so it goes on to say the intent is to start collecting use of force data at that time, meaning the end of June of 2019? Well, Madam Chair, I, I, I think I can bring, bring some clarity to both seven and eight uh, just at the same time three. because they, they're, they are similar in nature. Is uh, the um, Title 202366 uh, often referred to as the fair and impartial policing policy? Mm -hmm. um, also, um, there is a, um, a component of Title 202366, which is also data, which is data collection. That's where data. Co that's where it lives. Data collection. And the ori the original way in which this was written, the proposal to include use of force data collection. Uh, was written in such a way where it would be phased in, and this, this is really structural in terms of how it is written in the statute. The manner which is written in uh, H868 seems to suggest uh, that the way, because of what, it, what they did is, is they just simply um, changed the date to the main paragraph and then included use of force. Whereas what they should have did was is they should have um, stated that use of force would be integrated at a time in the future. So in short, what this does is it, um, it, it makes it seem as though no data collection would have to occur until this date to, uh, to include the data that's currently being collected. So it just, it just could be phrased in a better way just to make sure it's in, it indicates that if we're going to collect use of force data, that particular component of data collection would start on this date. And the same thing with the, if you take a look at uh, section eight, when you're, when you're looking at training, it was written in the same way. It made it, made it look like training would start um, 
in March of 19, 2019. Training is already underway. So it's just appropriate use of force, de-escalation, uh, and cross-cultural awareness training that would start in 2019. Okay, so just be. I just was asking the, the committee to be mindful when you read H68 that that particular language could create a problem for us if it was introduced as it was stated. But if you would refer to the amendment that we submitted on eight on S two eighty one, which I provided to you in email, that language is is uh, is closer to where we'd want to be. Okay. So that covers seven and eight, Madam Chair. Timing is <laughs> because you notice the rules no one these are as one 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 witnesses uh, and, and interested parties. Now you gave us a, a ton of information. It was very important for you to mm -hmm. walk us through mm -hmm. this. It, it put, if you will, clothing on the otherwise unclad. Uh, Emperor? That. <laughs> on the <laughs> uh, Okay. I thank you uh, for an thank opportunity you. to appear. Appreciate your coming back to help with that. It's a pleasure, and I also would uh, hold out that if there's anything that the committee or the chair would require in, in moving forward to make a determination uh, on moving forward, I, I would avail, I'd make myself available. And a question in that regard, because yes. knowing it, it's not the easiest thing sometimes to trace between the cabinet and here <laughs> and back again. Uh, I've had a full day already. Yeah, I <laughs> um, Would by telephone be... That, that would be fine. That would be fine. You must have your phone number somewhere. In it's, I'm sure it's on the record. Yes, so you got it somewhere. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you so much. And, and be safe today with all of the stuff happening in the building. Uh, you know something you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly I do. <laughs> <laughs>